The day before, my wife, Tanya, had blindsided me by filing divorce papers. She also froze all of our personal and company assets and put a restraining order on me. Tanya accused me of mentally and physically abusing her, which was total bullshit. At that point, I thought my life had hit rock bottom, but I was wrong. What brought me to complete despair was when I discovered that Tanya had stolen all the songs I'd written. Some of them had great sentimental value, but now they were gone. I knew she would destroy my originals as soon as she transcribed them in her own handwriting. It was very depressing. But that was yesterday. Today, however, when I woke up, I was no longer tormented by self-pity. On the contrary, I had a burning desire to take revenge on my cheating wife, her manager, and her lover. And now I had an idea of how I could get back at them. And for that matter, it would give me back my self-respect. One of the things that made my blood pressure skyrocket yesterday was their attempt to keep me in New York for a few days. It was only later that I realized it was for two reasons. Not only did they want to humiliate me, but Tanya and Todd wanted time to get back to Atlanta and carry out their plan. I was sure they wanted to record the stolen songs and spread as many lies about me as possible. They canceled my first-class ticket and replaced it with an economy ticket for a flight three days later to give themselves time. I think they were hoping I would get angry and do something stupid. Then they could use that against me. But if Tanya and Todd had let me go back with them the same day, I wouldn't have had that chance to meet Dawn in Central Park. It didn't take a scientist to realize one reason Tanya and Todd wanted to trap me in New York. They believed that if I didn't have the financial means, I would fall into despair. They had no idea, however, that I had substantial funds to my own name. But as I sat in my hotel room planning my revenge, I realized that I was severely limited in what I could do. At this moment, I could not touch them physically, emotionally, or financially. The thought of killing them both ran through my mind dozens of times, but each time the thought came up, I dismissed it. For one thing, I wasn't a violent person, but more importantly, it would be too quick and easy. Okay, maybe the former was the most important thing, but I really wanted Tanya to feel the pain I could inflict on her for a long time. Even in my broken state, it was clear to me what was driving Tanya. She had fallen into the trap my grandfather had warned me about all those years ago. Tanya was now completely consumed with becoming a megastar and oblivious to anything else. This was confirmed when I spoke to my old agent who informed me that Tanya was in the process of rebranding her musical image. Of course, her new plans did not include me. Tanya was also trying to gain publicity and sympathy by portraying me as an evil partner who was bullying her. But I wasn't going to play their game. I had the slightest glimmer of an idea on how to strike back. And it all depended on Dawn showing up today and being willing to trust me. Yesterday, trying to clear my head, I decided to take a walk in Central Park. When I got there, however, I found a pretty young woman desperately trying to make some money by playing guitar and singing. Her guitar playing was pretty bad, but her voice was angelic. On a whim, I decided to sing with her for a while, which turned into a mini-concert. While I was singing, a plan occurred to me. It was a crazy plan, but it was probably the only way I could get back at Tanya. If possible, I was going to sabotage her new number. Furthermore, I was going to try to make myself a bigger star than she could ever be. In order to do that, however, I was sure that Dawn was the key to my half-crazy plan. If she didn't show up, I didn't know what I was going to do because I had no way of contacting her. I didn't even know her last name. Despite my deep anxiety about whether or not she would show up at 10 o'clock, I was full of renewed energy. The whole time I played and sang with Dawn, I didn't think about Tanya. But that night the pain and self-pity came over me again, and the tears flowed again. But when morning came, the thought of playing my music made the self-pity evaporate. I took a quick shower, ate breakfast, and headed outside. I found a music store that opened at 9 and bought myself a guitar. It wasn't expensive, but I'm sure it cost at least four times as much as Dawn's guitar, and mine was much better. By 9.30, I was sitting on the stairs waiting. After making sure Dawn wouldn't show up by 10.20, I began to assemble my new guitar. I was bitterly disappointed. But as I was about to leave, I saw her hurrying down the street. Dawn was clutching a little girl in her hand. She tried to walk as fast as she could, but the child's short legs limited their speed. I was afraid you weren't coming, I said to a panting Dawn. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Dawn apologized. 
I couldn't find anyone to watch my daughter. I watched her as she tried to catch her breath. I could read the uncertainty in her eyes like she was afraid I'd get angry. She looked up at me, her lips trembling. Don't worry, I grinned, holding my new instrument in my hands. It gave me a chance to buy a guitar. Wow, that's a really nice guitar, Dawn said, looking at my guitar and hers. It's actually not that good, I commented as I started tuning it. Still, it's a better piece compared to that old one you're using. As I tuned the guitar, I looked at Dawn and her daughter. I estimated that the girl was about four or five years old and the resemblance was obvious. I also noticed that Dawn had brushed her hair and even put on a little makeup. She was wearing a different dress today, and it was just as revealing as the last one. Dawn was pretty but too thin. Unfortunately, her daughter looked too thin too. If they had to survive on what Dawn earned singing in New York, things were not good. Dawn's daughter hung on her mother's leg, occasionally sticking her head out to look at me. Finally, I smiled at her and said, You're a pretty girl. Will you help us sing? The girl quickly buried her face in her mother's side. Dawn apologized. I'm sorry, she's very shy. No need to apologize, I offered lightly. When I was a kid, I wouldn't even leave my room if someone came to visit. Hey, I said, suddenly remembering that I'd brought some snacks from the room. After restocking the minibar, there was still plenty left in there. Want a cookie? I offered, holding out a package of chocolate chip cookies. The girl looked at the package, then at her mom. Dawn nodded, but Allison wouldn't take them from me, so I handed them to her mom. She's smart not to take a cookie from someone as weird as me. Dawn smiled and knelt down next to her daughter. This nice man and I are going to sing some songs. I want you to be a good girl and sit next to me. You can eat cookies while we play. Can you do that? Allison nodded but didn't say anything. Soon she was sitting next to her mom and devouring a small package of cookies. It was quite obvious that the girl was hungry. I rummaged in my pocket and pulled out a couple packs of candy bars. I tossed them to her. Here, I don't know if you like candy bars, and it's okay if you don't. Dawn opened a new package and whispered in her daughter's ear. The girl nodded, looked at me and smiled. Thanks for the cookies. My pleasure, I said, returning the smile. And I still think you're a beautiful girl. The girl giggled and buried her head in her mom's leg again. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself, I said with a smile. I'm Robbie Wilder, and you are? Dawn blushed slightly. Yeah, I don't think we introduced ourselves yesterday. I'm Dawn Samuels, and this is my daughter, Allison. Now that we're done with introductions, let's sing, I said, starting to strum my guitar. We started again with Amazing Grace, which immediately drew a small crowd. As we continued to sing, the crowd grew larger and larger, and the donations falling into Dawn's open guitar case kept coming in at a steady pace. Around 11.30, I decided we needed a break. I could see that Dawn was tired and Allison was starting to get nervous. Say, we'll take a break for half an hour to 45 minutes, I said to the crowd, which had grown to about 50 or 60 people. We're just going to grab a bite to eat, so come back and tell your friends. The crowd groaned a little, but then began to disperse. Putting the guitar away, I looked at Allison. Hey babe, would you like something to eat? Allison looked up and nodded. You like hot dogs? She nodded again. There's a vendor over there, I pointed with my chin. I'll get us something to eat and drink. How much do you want? I asked Allison. Two, she said quietly, raising two fingers. Allison, Dawn said sternly. The girl looked at the ground, then at her mother and finally at me. Please. I laughed. How many do you think your mommy will have? Allison held up two fingers again and smiled shyly. I laughed again. I can pay, Dawn said, digging in her guitar case. I waved her away. Keep your money. It's my treat. I suspect you need the money a lot more than I do. Thanks, Dawn said, nodding. I made $447.52 yesterday. I was able to pay some of my bills and give some money to my aunt. If I can make the same amount of money today, it will help Allison and me a lot. Don't worry, you'll make more than that today, I said confidently as I headed to the hot dog vendor. I brought six hot dogs, ten bottles of water, two apples, and a dozen cookies. Allison and Dawn ate hungrily. I suspected they hadn't had breakfast. As I ate, 
I realized that the whole time we were playing, I hadn't thought about Tanya and all the confusion I was facing. However, now that I thought about it, my heart squeezed. I felt so completely alone. Thoughts were swirling around in my head that I would never find anyone who could love me again. But the thought of being able to play my music lifted my spirits a little. Besides, I was now mentally putting the pieces together to hit Tanya back. It was also helping to soothe the pain inside of me. Once we were done with our meal, we moved on to another place. Here there was a more open space with benches all around. We found a shady spot and Dawn was able to spread out her coat on the ground. Allison curled up on it and soon fell asleep. After lunch we started again with amazing grace. Soon a crowd began to gather. As people began to stand 10 and 20 at a time, I told Dawn that we needed to sing a little louder. I was impressed with the strength and clarity of her voice. And as we sang, people kept throwing money into the box. After about an hour, I noticed a TV reporter standing at the edge of the crowd with his cameraman. After finishing the song, I told the crowd that we would take a five-minute break. I then approached the reporter. What's up, guys? I asked. The reporter, pretty in that commercial kind of way that most female reporters look, smiled at me. You're Robbie Wilder, aren't you? I smiled and nodded. My bad. Is it true you and Tanya are getting divorced? I remembered what I'd been told to do to change the version Tanya was probably going to put out. I shrugged. Unfortunately, it's true, but it's not my choice. According to reports, she claims that you physically and mentally abused her during the marriage. If you're interested in the truth, I said, struggling to contain my anger. You should talk to all the people who have worked beside us over the years. They'll tell you that I'm not a violent person in any way, shape, or form. The last time I hit someone was in fifth grade when I hit Jimmy Fuller because he pushed me. So, what are you singing here in Central Park? The reporter turned the interview in a different direction. I had no idea if she believed me or not, but I told the truth. I didn't know if the network would decide to pass on my retraction or try to spin it in Tanya's favor. It was up to the media to decide what was true and what wasn't. But there was nothing I could do about it. I could only play the reporter and hope he would report the truth of what I had said. It's a beautiful day, I finally answered the reporter with a smile. Who wouldn't want to be in Central Park today? But why are you singing with that girl? Oh, Dawn, I continued to smile. I'm trying to help her earn some money so she can take care of her little girl. I pointed to where Allison was sleeping. I talked to the reporter for about five more minutes and made sure she understood that there was more than just a divorce going on between me and Tanya. I broached the subject of how I'd been kicked out of the company. And for extra convincing, I added that Tanya had canceled my plane ticket to fly home on the same flight and replaced it with a ticket three days later. After the interview, I went back to playing and singing with Dawn. Around 2.30, Allison woke up and was hungry. That's what I bought the cookies for. She was happy as a clam, eating her chocolate chip cookie, drinking water, and listening to Mom and I sing. By 3 o'clock, the crowd had grown to a 100 people, and then the police showed up. They said we had to call it a day. Everybody blames the police and nobody more than the NYPD, and some of them are justified. But the two police officers who told us it was time to call it a day were very nice. They kept apologizing and telling us we could come back tomorrow, but if the crowd got too big, they'd have to shut us down again. I gave each of them a bottle of water and a cookie. I assured the two policemen that it was not a bribe. They laughed and wished us well. I was glad that the policeman didn't know who I was and treated me like any other person. I took Dawn and Allison out to an early dinner. When they put down our plates and gave Allison the crayons, she melted our waitress's heart. Allison asked in a tiny voice if she could color one of the pictures on the mat. Allison said she would only color one and leave the rest for someone else. The waitress brought three more crayon mats and told Allison to color whatever she wanted. The waitress even brought Allison a special dessert that she didn't charge us for. During dinner, I briefly told Dawn about an idea that had been running around in my head all day. I hoped that I could organize a new gig with the two of us. Dawn was very hesitant at first. I kept insisting that it would be a way to make some money to take care of her daughter. Finally, Dawn gave up and said she needed to talk to her Aunt Claire. <laughs> I didn't know if Dawn was just trying to brush me off, but I understood her. This was a very big decision for her. I mean, 
I was asking her to turn her life and her daughter's life upside down to follow me to Atlanta. I told her that I would go along with whatever decision she made. In addition, I told her that I still had a lot of details to put together. And if I couldn't get it all sorted out, at least I would leave her my new guitar and $500. But if I can get it all sorted out, then she and her aunt will have to decide if they want to come back to Atlanta with me and take a chance on my plan. I told her I'd call her in the morning. If they weren't interested, the guitar and $500 would still be at Don's house, and I would fly back to Atlanta alone. After three hours on the phone that night, however, all the pieces fell into place. Even Alex was in agreement. He wanted to get back into the music game, and his doctor had cleared him to work. Alex also informed me that Todd had announced that Tanya would be releasing two new songs the following week. I was sure they would be the same two stolen songs. But there was nothing I could do about it because the copyright on the songs was not protected. The thought that Tanya was going to profit from her betrayal only fueled my anger. I wanted to destroy her so badly that it would be my driving force for years to come. Now I was chasing stardom with all my might. If my grandfather was trying to reach me from the other side of the world, I certainly wasn't listening to him. In the evening, I watched the newscast and was pleasantly surprised. Apparently, they had done a real investigation. They had contacted some of the people who had worked with me, and those confirmed that they had seen absolutely no violence. Moreover, they all stated that, as far as they had been able to find out, I was a loving husband, willing to do anything to make my wife happy. Some even said I was too kind. When the sister station reporter caught up with Todd, he looked a little flustered. The reporter told Todd that the people working next to me and Tanya hadn't confirmed the abuse. But Todd quickly oriented himself and said that all of the abuse was happening behind closed doors. He also told the reporter that Tanya never told anyone about it for fear it would hurt their business. Todd continued to lie and said that Tanya had finally had enough and couldn't take it anymore, so she filed for divorce. When they asked Todd about freezing my assets and replacing the airline ticket, he was smooth as silk. He explained that the distribution of assets would be decided by the court, and the airline ticket was just a travel agent's mistake. I have to hand it to him, he was a skillful liar. I really liked the part of the news about Don and Allison. They looked so vulnerable and scared when the cameraman filmed them, and I especially liked the last line of the report. The reporter said, even as Robbie Wilder's career seems to have gone downhill, he seems more interested in making life a little better for a mother and her daughter. I recorded the interview and sent a copy to Alex. A few minutes later, my phone rang. Robbie, this interview is pure gold, Alex reported cheerfully. It won't undo what Tanya and Todd have already done, but it will give us an edge they never dreamed of. We talked for another half hour discussing what I needed to do before Alex started working with his contacts to launch my new career. There were hundreds of decisions to make and hundreds of things to do in that time. But in order to get my revenge, there was still one important thing to settle. I had to convince Dawn and her aunt that I wasn't some creep and that my plan was real. So, the next morning I called Dawn and she invited me to New Jersey to meet her aunt. The cab driver going to New Jersey was very nice. A nice New Yorker. I tipped him well. I had to do some searching, but I found their apartment, which was a little old. Still, the grounds were well-maintained, although the neighborhood was a little dirty. I've seen worse. The apartment itself was simple, with two bedrooms and one bath. The living room had a couch and a few pieces of furniture. One bedroom was larger, with a bed and dresser. The second bedroom only had a queen-sized mattress and a few boxes that held Dawn and Allison's clothes. Robbie, this is my aunt, Claire Samuels. Dawn introduced me to her aunt. She's my mother's sister. Claire was a beautiful woman in her early fifties. There were strands of gray peeking through her brown hair, and her face had more than one or two wrinkles. Nevertheless, her eyes were bright and her smile was charming. I learned a little more about Dawn and her life. Dawn's parents had both died. Her father was in a car accident when Dawn was fifteen. Her mother died two years later from cancer. Dawn was married for a short time. She didn't want to talk about her ex-husband, only saying he was possessive and mean. It became clear to me that the last few years had been very difficult for Dawn. It took an hour of explanation, but eventually both women understood and agreed. In fact, it was Claire who had finally convinced Dawn that there was nothing for her and Allison to do in New Jersey or New York. In fact, Claire said there was nothing for her there either. 
She asked if she could come with us. I was thrilled at the idea, and my aunt's presence seemed to allay Dawn's fears a bit. Now, it took two more days for Claire and Dawn to finish their business in New Jersey, and by 3.40 in the afternoon, all four of us were on a plane to Atlanta. Even though it was just under two hours away, I was already getting impatient. Ideas were flooding my brain. There were hundreds of little things to take care of, from getting Dawn, Allison, and Claire settled into booking studio time. I also needed to buy Dawn a new guitar, decide on a new name, and, most importantly, start training Dawn as a professional singer. Fortunately, Alex would be there to help do much of what needed to be done. My plan was simple. Since Tanya had suspended me from our singing show, I was to create an entirely new show with Dawn as my new partner. I was going to start slow and then develop our show, hoping to reach the top of the entertainment world. Or at the very least, I wanted Dawn and I to become more famous people than Tanya. That alone would have frozen my ex-wife's ass off. At the same time, Alex and I would be looking for ways to hurt Tanya's career. In my opinion, that would have gone a long way to repaying Tanya. Truth be told, I didn't believe we could achieve superstardom, but I was convinced that we would become bigger and better than Tanya because I knew my future ex-wife's limitations. I discarded my grandfather's advice without a second thought, and I intended to work my ass off for everyone to get us where I wanted to be. I didn't care who I had to cross to reach my goal, but I had no idea what the price would be or who would end up having to pay. Part 5. For most of my career, I never wanted to be a celebrity. So I always let my wife, Tanya, be the face of our band. I also never considered myself an entertainer. To me, I was just a guitar player who also loved to sing. If people wanted to listen to me, that was great, but I was just as happy playing and singing on my own. But then my wife tried to destroy me personally, professionally, and financially. Now I was involved in an all-out fight to get revenge. Tanya had betrayed me, humiliated me, and tried to destroy my career. If that wasn't enough, she also tried to cripple me financially and stole all the original copies of the songs I had written. Sure, a lot of those songs weren't that good, but they were mine, and some of those songs had great sentimental value to me. Also, I was convinced that my two new songs were very good. I've learned over the years that if you work on something for a long time, it usually turns out better. That's what happened with my songwriting. Although I didn't realize it at the time, the songs I was writing now were some of the best of my career, and they would get even better. The flight from New York to Atlanta took just under two hours. Still, I was going crazy just sitting there, going over in my mind the hundreds of things I needed to do to start getting my revenge. To calm my anxiety, I started writing a new song. By the time we got to Atlanta, I already had outlines for two new songs, Treason Was Always In Your Heart, and Desperate Nights But Bright Tomorrow. Back in Atlanta, I decided it would be best to work away from the city. I arranged for Dawn, Allison, and Claire to stay with my parents in Tifton. I had originally thought of renting an apartment big enough for the four of us, but I thought that would be too creepy. So I rented a small apartment for myself near my parents' house. My mom was thrilled with the idea, but my dad was not so thrilled. He didn't make a big fuss, though. My mom and Claire became instant friends, and they both enjoyed taking care of Allison. But no matter how much attention the two older women paid to Allison, my father really liked her. Although he didn't want to admit it, they grew close. Most of the time, when I came to visit, Dad would play some game with Allison or read a book to her, or she would just sit on his lap while he told her stories. Two days after Dawn and her family were settled, I brought her to the makeshift studio I had set up in a rented office. I brought in an instrument teacher to help Dawn learn to play the guitar better. I also brought in a voice coach to help her develop her singing style. I had to meet with lawyers, decide on costumes, even find a drama coach to help Dawn with her stage demeanor. I was draining my savings, but I didn't care. I was pushing everyone, including myself. But no matter how hard we all worked, no one worked harder than Dawn. She practiced her guitar until her fingers bled. Then Dawn would put a band-aid on and keep practicing. After a couple months, she started to play pretty well. Dawn was never going to be a great guitarist, but she was still pretty good. Finally, when I decided we had made significant progress, I booked time at a studio in Atlanta. I purposely avoided the studio that Tanya and I used. 
I could have gone back to that studio since the restraining order had been lifted. But the people in that studio knew Tanya was cheating, and they didn't say a word. They were dead to me. As I worked with Dawn, honing our moves, the divorce continued. Lawyers and accountants were involved in the squabbles over the business. I paid no attention to either of them. Even though I wouldn't use the old studio, I called the owner and explained to him why I wouldn't be returning. I did this because I wanted Tanya to know how aware I was of her betrayal and that there would be consequences. However, when we arrived for the first recording session at the new studio, I thought all my plans would be over before they even started. Dawn was absolutely terrified the first time I put her in front of the microphone. She froze every time we tried to record something. Luckily, my mom, Claire and Allison, came with us. After two hours of accomplishing nothing, I was completely frustrated. I didn't know what to do. I finally called a break and told everyone to go to an early lunch. I desperately wanted to record something because the studio was costing a lot of money with musicians and everything. So far, we didn't have anything. As the musicians were getting ready to put their instruments away, Allison peeked into the studio. She leaned her head against her mother's shoulder. You're not going to sing, Mommy, she asked with worried eyes. Dawn looked at her daughter's questioning look. She smiled and nodded. I'm going to sing right now, baby. With those words, Dawn stood up and walked over to the microphone. I signaled the musicians to pick up their instruments. I then ordered the controllers to get ready. Dawn looked at me, smiled, and nodded. Then the recording session began in earnest. It took several hours, but we managed to record two songs I'd written on the return flight. Alex immediately released them with as much fanfare as he was capable of. The songs did well, with Desperate Nights But Bright Tomorrows, reaching number 12. But Cheating Was Always In Your Heart reached only 19th place. These two new songs were to let the audience know that my new band was a reality. Alex was very satisfied because the new songs did the job and more. Tanya, on the other hand, started her solo career in a big way. She was written about in all entertainment publications, and Tanya appeared on television several times. She was smart enough not to insist on accusations of abuse, saying only that people have different opinions about what constitutes abuse. However, the thought still lingered in my soul that Tanya would use the song she had stolen from me, and there was nothing I could do about it. But the thought that she would probably destroy my original copies made me even angrier. One of those songs I wrote for my grandfather. It wasn't very good, but my grandfather had tears in his eyes when I first played the song to him. Most people who knew Tanya well realized that her only goal in life was to become a superstar. And you have to hand it to Tanya. She worked her ass off to realize her dream. What Tanya and Todd didn't realize, however, was that while I was building my new career, I was doing everything I could to torpedo it. Basically, I was getting people to spread true and made-up rumors about Tanya anything to tarnish her image. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that my plans were going to fail, so I pushed everyone even harder. Dawn was just raw talent, but I saw great potential in her. Alex completely agreed with my opinion after watching a YouTube report of us in Central Park. I felt blessed that he had decided to come out of retirement to manage Dawn and me. The litigation had become a mess. I only paid attention to what was going on when the lawyers insisted except for the fact that the restraining order was lifted and the court granted me limited access to Tanya's and my old company's income, I didn't care anymore. I knew that eventually the divorce would be finalized and the business problem settled. But now I was only interested in revenge. The rumors I was spreading had little effect on Tanya's career. But it was actually being held back by Tanya's limited abilities. Still, I had to succeed much more than she did, because only then would I feel that I had truly gotten my revenge. Only then would Tanya realize that it wasn't me holding her back, but she was holding me back. For Tanya, I knew this would be a crushing blow. As I've said before, I never considered myself a celebrity. In my prime years, I considered Tanya and I to be average B-level singers. We performed in front of superstars, played mid-sized venues with other bands, and headlined at smaller venues. But throughout our career together, it was Tanya that fans wanted to see, not me. But even still, Dawn seemed to be completely intimidated by me. Because of this, it was difficult for me to make any adjustments to what she was doing. Finally, one morning in the studio, I lost my temper. 
After I told Dawn that she was too stiff and should let her body sway to the beat of the music, tears ran down her cheeks. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilder, she said with trembling lips. I'll try harder. Dawn, please, I said through clenched teeth. Don't call me Mr. Wilder. This made it even worse, as Dawn's whole body seemed to shake and the tears flowed even harder. What, what should I call you? She asked through shaky sobs. Call me Robbie, or hey you, or asshole. I respond to all those names. Just don't call me Mr. Wilder, that's my father. What's an asshole? Asked Allison from the corner of the studio where she was coloring. I groaned. Oh my God, I really put my foot in my mouth, I said, looking at Allison and then at my shoes. And these particular shoes taste awful. I'm sorry, Dawn. It won't happen again. I was greatly relieved that instead of being upset, Dawn stopped crying and smiled. What's a nithead? Asked Allison again. It's something I'm not supposed to say, I explained to Allison. It's what people call me when they don't like me. Allison stood up, ran over to me, and hugged my leg tightly. She looked at me with a sad expression on her face. No one should call you that. You're a good person. I kissed Allison on the top of her head, and she went back to her corner to continue coloring. I looked at Dawn and she nodded at me. My daughter is right. No one should call you that. I laughed. But I'm still responding to it. Dawn laughed and we went back to work. After that, she started calling me Robbie. But it was slow going, as Dawn was still intimidated by just about everything. She could sing, but her demeanor on stage was very stilted and awkward. By the end of two months, I had gotten rid of most of the rough edges. The rest was to come with time and experience. I gave Dawn a list of lines she could say during the show, and I myself played off of them and tried to make her look witty and warm. Finally, I decided that in order for Dawn to get better, we needed to perform in front of a live audience. So after discussing it with Alex, we decided it would be best to start the show where Tanya and I had started, at Big Carl's restaurant. Alex arranged everything, and Carl was delighted. To my surprise, the bar was full that first night. I had hoped the bar would be half full, like it was when we started with Tanya. Dawn was terrified and threw up shortly before we started the show. I wish I could say that once Dawn got on stage, she relaxed. But she wasn't. She was like a deer ready to bolt at any second. So I took over and just left her in the background, interacting with the crowd. I lightly touched on Tanya's problems and my own. Then I made a few harmless jokes a few times at Tanya's expense, and then told how Dawn and I met. I painted a picture of finding this beautiful flower in dirty, disgusting New York City. I told them that New Yorkers could be the coldest people in the world, but when Dawn started singing, they stopped and even smiled. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the Central Park songbird, Dawn Samuels. Polite applause broke out. Just like Central Park, I said softly to Dawn, bringing her forward. Then I began to play Amazing Grace. When we finished, the hall exploded with applause. Dawn only smiled shyly and nodded her head. About a third of the way through our performance, Tanya and Todd suddenly appeared. We were in the middle of a song when people started murmuring and getting up to watch. Finally, Tanya proceeded to the table that was reserved for her. That asshole Carl didn't say a word to me. When I looked back at the bar, he was standing there smirking. I smirked back at him. I couldn't be mad after all. He had warned me that he couldn't be trusted. Instead of finishing the song, I asked Dawn to stop and made her back up a little. As Tanya moved forward, I realized I could use this appearance to our advantage. I'm sure Tanya and Todd thought they would be able to put us on stage and possibly unnerve Dawn. Well, we're honored tonight, guys. Tanya has decided to join us, I announced to cheers from the audience. Damn it, Tanya, you can definitely suck all the air out of a room. Tanya smiled broadly, and the audience applauded. When the applause died down, I pointed to a table of men in the far corner of the room. Tanya, don't you think that dress is a little conservative? I'm not sure those guys over there will be able to see your belly button. The crowd erupted into laughter. The smile never left Tanya's face, and she didn't back down. Is this part of your folk charm I read about? You know better, I said with a wide grin. You and I have had a lot of conversations, haven't we? And it was fun, as I recall. Only in your imagination, Tanya grinned. 
That drew laughter from the crowd. Oh, I replied, grinning even wider. Some might say it's mental abuse, but in hindsight, I think you're right. Maybe it was all just in my imagination. So, do you understand why I'm confused? Why you're here today? Tanya turned to the audience. She was so predictable. I just wanted to show you that there are no hard feelings. Our differences will be settled in court. And regardless, I wanted to wish you success in your new venture. And while we're on the subject of performances, I'd like to let your wonderful audience know that I'm starting my final tour. We start right here in Atlanta at the Cobb Energy Performing Arts Center in two weeks. Knowing what she was doing, I pounced. In this era of good feelings, why don't you come here and give these people a preview of your concert? Why don't you sing one of your old songs? Friends, you'd like to hear Tanya sing, wouldn't you? It was an unexpected treat for those gathered, and they responded positively. I'm sure these visitors came to see me out of curiosity. I had no doubt that many of them were wondering what I would do now that Tanya and I were no longer together. Besides, they didn't have to pay admission. But now they were about to see me and Tanya half reunited. Of course, I had more than that planned. I whispered to Dawn that no matter what happened between me and Tanya, she should ignore the whole thing. I also told Dawn that I wanted her to join in on the second song. Knowing Tanya, I was sure she wouldn't pass up such an opportunity. I didn't know what song she would want to sing. However, I wanted her to sing one song with me, True Love by Patsy Cline. I was also sure she wouldn't want to sing that particular song because it was our song together. But even if Tanya refused to sing it, Dawn and I would sing it, and it would have the same effect. After a moment's hesitation, Tanya nodded and headed toward the stage. Once she was there with microphone in hand, I started playing Pretty Little Girl. It wasn't one of our hits, but Tanya loved it. Tanya even smiled at me before she started singing. When she finished, the crowd eagerly responded. Before Tanya could do anything else, I said, Let's do another one. I immediately started playing True Love. Tanya looked unsure at first, but then she shrugged her shoulders and got ready to sing. However, when she and I started, Dawn joined in as well. This caused a roar from the crowd and a confused look from Tanya. As we continued to sing, I turned back and forth to Tanya and Dawn. Finally, at one point, when the song went, For You and I Have a Guardian Angel, I turned away from Tanya and smiled warmly at Dawn. The symbolism was clear to everyone in the room, including Tanya and Dawn. I moved away from Tanya, and Dawn was now my musical partner. When we finished, the room erupted into a roar. Tanya quickly thanked everyone and slipped away. The rest of the concert went very well, except that Dawn never relaxed or felt at ease on stage. The next day, the newspapers were full of praise for our performance. They especially talked about what a wonderful partnership Tanya and I had had. They regretted that we had broken up. But they wrote enthusiastically about Dawn and how she was a worthy replacement. I thought it was funny because the media never gave Tanya and I that much attention until we broke up. Nevertheless, I was extremely pleased that we had gotten such publicity. I think Tanya wanted to embarrass Dawn and me, crash our show, and promote her new tour. She only succeeded in one of those goals. But even that limited success was short-lived. The next day, Alex announced that we were starting our own tour at the Roxy in downtown Atlanta on the same day Tanya's tour started. Alex told me that Tanya had called him as soon as she heard about our tour and was rude to him. He only laughed it off. What Alex didn't tell Tanya was that he organized our tour so that about 80% of our shows were on the same day and in the same city as Tanya's shows. I followed the reviews of each of our concerts. I especially remember the review of Tanya's concert in Atlanta. It was very favorable, but the article talked about how sad they were that Tanya and I were no longer together. Yet, when I read the review of Dawn and I's concert, it was also very favorable, but it didn't mention Tanya. That had to have given her ass a big kick in the ass. During the first tour, Alex had to book us gigs in smaller venues. The main reason was that Alex didn't think we could fill a large audience, and he wanted our tour to be successful financially. Some of the venues we performed in could barely hold 300 people. On top of that, we were warming up for some of the biggest names in the industry. The tour lasted 14 weeks and was very grueling. In the meantime, Todd invited Tanya to the big venues, and at first they were a big success. But by the end of the tour, they stopped selling out. 
Todd also turned down all offers to perform in front of any of the big-name stars. Even though we traveled from city to city on our tour, I continued to write new material. On the road, I finished five songs. All but one were duets. My Woman and My Lover. I sang as solos. We started adding new songs to the shows one at a time. And when we got back to Atlanta, we got in the studio and recorded a new album that included all five songs. My Woman and My Lover began a steady climb up the country charts. It reached number two and remained in the top ten for six weeks. A week after the album reached number two on the country chart, it moved to number nine on the Billboard pop chart. It took almost eight months, but now I'd say Don and I were definitely at the top of the B range. We may not have been superstars, but I was pleased with our ascent in the music world. During this same time, Tanya's star didn't really ignite, if at all. She was doing well, but Todd couldn't take her to the top of the mountain or even close to it. After one show, a reporter interviewed me and asked how I was doing after breaking up with Tanya. I replied that I was doing great. Then the reporter asked what I thought about Tanya's new career. I knew he was catching a trick moment, so I answered him. I have no idea about anything Tanya is doing, I replied innocently. Is she still performing? Apparently, Tanya had seen my comment and had some nasty things to say about me during her next gig. Now there were constant disagreements between me and Tanya. I always left my comments in a joking way. Tanya, on the other hand, got nasty at times. It didn't help her at all. The lawyers were pushing us to finalize the accounting of our old partnership to close it down and distribute the assets. But when Todd took over the books, he changed the accounting system and it became difficult to determine anything. It was a complete mess. And by this time, I knew there was nothing I could do about the songs Tanya had stolen. I had finally come to terms with it. Nevertheless, I was sad that the song I had written for my grandfather was gone. While the corporate war continued, the divorce suddenly slowed to a snail's pace. The main stumbling block was still the same issue, Todd's accounting system. I was entitled to half of what we had accumulated during the marriage. However, Todd's convoluted accounting system made it extremely difficult to identify assets and their physical location. Todd had created dozens of corporations, and money was flowing from one to the next. My attorney had a CPA firm comb through all the records to come up with an accurate list of everything. And from what the accountants told me, Todd was no help at all. In addition, much of the information they were digging up was extremely painful. When the accountants checked the company's travel expenses, I learned that all those public relations trips Tanya and I had been sent on separately had been a smokescreen. I was led to believe that Tanya went on her trips alone and I was in another part of the country at the time. Todd was supposedly in Atlanta taking care of business. But Todd went on every trip with Tanya. Not only that, but they shared a room each time. They must have had a great time laughing at my stupidity. And yet, while my legal troubles dragged on, my professional career was as vibrant as ever. Our last album was going very well, and our concert schedule was filled through the end of the fiscal year. True, most of the concerts were open to other stars. Nevertheless, they were well paid. To top it all off, I was nominated for a Grammy Award. For my woman and my lover for Best Country Song. I kept pushing Dawn and myself to be better and better, but I was starting to get concerned about Dawn. She was still struggling before each performance and it took her a day or two to calm down afterward. I knew she was taking prescribed sedatives, but I had no idea how much the performances were affecting her. One day my mom brought Allison into the studio and pulled me aside with a stern expression on her face. Don't you dare hurt those girls, mom warned me, pointing at Down and Allison in the studio. Mom, why did you say that? I was genuinely shocked by her comment. I would never hurt Dawn or Allison. Dawn is head over heels in love with you. My mother's eyes were like lasers nailing me in place. She's nervous because she's afraid she'll let you down. If I was surprised by her warning about hurting Dawn and Allison, I was completely stunned and at a loss for words at her declaration that Dawn loved me. They were both very dear to me, but I was almost 10 years older than Dawn. It never occurred to me that she would ever show any romantic interest in me. Besides, I wasn't sure I could ever trust another woman again. Mom, come on, I'm ten years older than her, I finally protested. Dawn won't be interested in me. She'll find someone her own age. 
Mom shook her head with a tiny smile on her face. Robbie, you can be so stupid sometimes. That girl is hopelessly in love with you. If you'd pull your head out of your ass and stop trying to get back at Tanya for one second, you'd realize that. Besides, her girl considers you her father and loves you to bits. I continued to protest my mother's assertions until she ended the conversation, once again warning me not to hurt Dawn or Allison. When my mother left, I sat outside the studio and watched Dawn and Allison play with Allison's dolls. I had always thought Dawn was very pretty, but now I realized she was just beautiful. And Allison was like an angel. If I ever had a daughter, I would want her to be just like Allison. I sat like that for probably 10 minutes, trying to sort out my feelings. One thing my mom said was true. I really had my head up my ass about Tanya. Everything I did was aimed at proving to my soon-to-be ex-wife that she had made a terrible mistake and punishing her for it. Suddenly, I was reminded of my grandfather's advice. He warned me against chasing fame as a musician. But his advice was a warning about people missing out on life by chasing a dream that will never come true. What I did was far worse. I chased a dream to get back at Tanya, and Don had to pay the price. The more I thought about me and Don being together, the more the idea seemed ridiculous. Why would a beautiful, talented woman like Dawn be interested in me? But then I began to consider our careers. We were successful. No, we weren't superstars and unlikely to reach that plateau. Yet I kept striving for more. And even though Dawn never liked performing, she stayed with me. Perhaps my mom was right. I went back and forth until I finally decided that today was the day we were going to change everything. When I walked into the studio, Allison squealed with delight and rushed over to me. I picked her up in my arms and swirled her around me. Then I kissed her forehead and put her back on the floor. I looked over at Dawn and she was glowing with happiness. I decided that I would start by changing today's schedule. I know I said I wanted to record those three songs, I said with a smirk, but I have a better idea. Why don't we just record one song today and then go do something fun? Doesn't anyone want to come with me to Centennial Olympic Park and have a picnic? I'd like to. I sure would. I'd love to, exclaimed Allison, bouncing in place. I looked at Dawn. How about you? Do you want to grab some hot dogs and go to the park? Her smile made my face all warm. Dawn nodded and said, That would be like that day in Central Park. That's exactly what I was thinking. We've been working too hard and we need to have some fun. Then I looked at Allison and said, if one little girl doesn't mind being very quiet, we can finish up quickly. But the recording didn't set up well. For one thing, the music track that had already been laid down turned out to be faulty. It took about 10 minutes to find a backup and have it ready. Then Dawn messed up the first two takes, and I messed up the third. At this point, Dawn burst into tears. You know what? said I, hugging her. Screw this song. Let's forget about recording it today. Let's try again on Thursday. Let's not waste this beautiful day. At Dawn sobbed on my shoulder for a few minutes and then looked up. I'll be okay. We can finish the song. I could tell by the look on her face that she was afraid I'd be disappointed in her. So I did the first thing that came to my mind. I hugged her warmly and kissed her cheek. Then I turned to Allison. Why don't we leave it up to Allison, I said, still hugging Dawn. What do you think we should do? Do we stay here? even if it takes all day to record this stupid song, or do we leave now and go to the park? Go to the park. Allison said it so fast that the words almost flowed together. Then we'll go to the park, I announced definitively. Before heading to the park, we stopped by Dawn's condominium where she now lived with her aunt. There she changed into Allison's clothes and got towels. From there, I headed to the original hot dog factory where I bought six hot dogs, a pack of fries, cookies, and a bottle of water. Our picnic started right after we found a nice shady spot to spread out a blanket. Once settled, I passed out the hot dogs and everything else. While Allison ate, her eyes never took her eyes off the many children running around the water fountain. Unable to restrain her daughter any longer, Dawn finally removed the girl's outer clothing, exposing her swimsuit. Then for the next hour, Dawn let Allison run around the water fountains, which were periodically shot into the air from Olympic rings set in the ground. Allison squealed with delight as the jet of water caught up with her as she ran back and forth across the playground. 
When Dawn decided Allison had had enough of swimming, she called her daughter back to the shady area and gave her a cookie. I decided it was time to figure out what Dawn wanted to do with her life. You're not really into performing, are you? I asked blandly. Dawn looked at me nervously. That's okay. I'm trying to figure out what we should do next, I explained. So tell me honestly, do you like performing? Dawn sat very still, looking at me as if trying to figure out what answer I wanted. I sat very quietly too, trying my best not to give away my preference in any way. After an awkward silence, Dawn shook her head, but then quickly added, but I'll perform for as long as you want me to. I had my answer, and I knew what I should do. I'm actually thinking of canceling our concerts for next year. We don't need the craziness of another tour. We both have enough money to last us for a while longer, and we're still getting pretty good royalties. Tears suddenly ran down Dawn's cheeks. You're firing me? You're breaking up our business? No, not at all, I replied immediately, shocked by Dawn's reaction. The last thing I wanted was for Dawn to get the impression that I wanted to get rid of her. I just like making music. I'm just a simple guitarist who sings. I get almost as much pleasure when I play guitar and sing alone as I do when I perform in front of thousands of people. It's all about the music. It fills my soul and makes me happy. Dawn looked up at me and sighed. I love to sing by myself or for the people I love. But big crowds freak me out. Before I could say anything else, our attention was diverted by a commotion in the park. Looking closer, I saw three black and two white teenagers harassing people. Mostly they seemed to be pouncing on the elderly because they were the most vulnerable. I hate bullies, so I immediately stood up. Eventually they stopped on one elderly gentleman and had already plowed him to the ground. Robbie, no, Don pleaded as I jumped to my feet and headed to the man's aid. You're going to get hurt. If I'd thought about what I was doing, I probably wouldn't have done it. I'm not a fighter and only know the bare minimum about self-defense. But like I said, I hate bullies, and I knew most of them were cowards. So I confronted the largest of the teenagers, who seemed to be the leader. Leave the gentleman alone, I said calmly but firmly. No. And what the hell are you going to do if I don't, the large black teen said, pulling a knife out of his pocket. He didn't press the button to open it but maybe that was because I immediately kicked him with all my might. I grabbed the knife and flicked it open. I had no intention of getting into a physical altercation. My plan was just to get the older gentleman away from trouble. But now I was in it, and I expected the other four to pounce on me. But almost at the same time the other men came running in with me. When I looked around for the other four teenagers, I saw only their backs. They were running as hard as they could away from their friend and away from the park. In the short time it took to help the older man up, I was shaking like a leaf. While I was gathering my thoughts, several ladies led the man over to a bench. A moment later, Dawn was in my arms, sobbing on my shoulder. Allison clung to her mother's leg and cried. You could have been killed, she repeated over and over. I reached down and picked Allison up on my hip and rested her head against my shoulder. Shh, it's okay, I said as calmly as I could. Nothing happened. I don't know what I'd do without you, Dawn said, and kissed me on the lips. I kissed her back and hugged them both. I looked around. A crowd was starting to gather around me. I knew that eventually the police would show up and I would have to answer a bunch of questions. I was relieved that no one recognized us yet. We had to get out of there. I gave the knife to one of the men who had come to help and told him I was taking my family home. As I started to pull away from the park, I noticed Dawn was still shaking from the collision with him. As I looked in the rearview mirror, I saw that Allison's eyes were fixed on me and her lips were trembling. Dawn, are you and Allison going to be okay? I asked, looking in her direction. Claire is going on a bus tour with my mom and dad. That means you'll be all alone tonight. You still look really upset. Dawn shook her head. I was just really afraid you might have gotten hurt or even killed. Look, why don't we just have a picnic at my house? I suggested with a smile. We'll stop at your place so you can get some clothes. Then we'll stop and get something for dinner. It might be best if you stay at my place for the night. I can set up a guest room for you and Allison. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, I Dawn nodded her head up and down and a smile appeared on her face. Then she turned to face Allison. Allie, would you like to spend the night at Robbie's house with your mom? 
A squeal from the back seat of the car nearly shattered my eardrums. Yes, Mommy, it'll be like a sleepover. Once we got to my apartment, we watched a couple of Disney movies, ate Chinese takeout, and then I led them to my guest bedroom. That night, after Dawn and Allison retired to their bed, I went to my room and crawled into bed. I guess the encounter in the park had knocked more energy out of me than I thought. Anyway, I fell asleep in less than a minute. In the night, I was awakened by a stirring on the bed. It was Dawn. At first, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Maybe now was the time to find out if Dawn and I were going to have something more than just a musical partnership. Are you sure you want to do this? I asked cautiously. Robbie, I started falling in love with you the second time we performed in Central Park, Dawn said, caressing my face. You were so nice to me the first time we played, even though I was so suspicious. And I have to admit, it was mostly the money that attracted me on the second day. But then, when I was late because I couldn't find anyone to watch Allison, I was overcome with panic that you wouldn't be there. When I saw you standing there with a warm smile on your face, I thought my heart would burst with joy. And then you were so kind and patient with Allison. Until she met you, Allison didn't know a single man who wasn't mean to her. Her father was always yelling at her. There's nothing special about me, I protested. And if your husband was yelling at Allison, he must have been a real creep. Allison is as sweet a girl as you've ever met. How could anyone be unkind to her? He was worse than a creep, but I was afraid to leave him, Dawn said with a hesitation in her voice. Eventually, I got fed up when he hit Allison with a belt. I was horrified. Did you go to the police? Yes, and he was arrested, but he didn't last long in jail. But during that time, I was referred to legal advice and got a divorce and a restraining order. Then I went to live with my aunt. But she was having a hard time supporting herself. Even with financial aid and food stamps, it was very expensive to live in New Jersey. I was so scared and depressed until you sang with me that first day. When I got home and realized how much money you had helped me make, I was happy for the first time in months. I was finally able to pay some bills. And you promised to sing with me the next day. That night I slept peacefully for the first time in months. Since then, you've always been there for Allison, for me, and even for my Aunt Claire. How could I not love you? Besides, when we were at the park today, you told everyone that we were your family. Well, so you know, I said, stroking her hair. I really do love you and Allison very much. And I want to take care of you both for as long as you'll let me. It will be forever, Dawn said, kissing me. The next few months were hectic and stressful, but I was the happiest I could ever remember being. I loved the way Dawn's face lit up when I walked into the room. And Allison became my special little buddy. If Dawn wasn't around, and sometimes even when she was, Allison would snuggle up to me. People in the studio started calling her my shadow. Over the next few weeks, as the lawsuits continued on their winding path, my relationship with Dawn grew stronger and more loving. I reduced our workload and told Alex to cancel all the concerts after the Grammys. He was a little disappointed, but not too disappointed. I told him we would still do one or two concerts a year and maybe even do a TV special if requested. We also promised to keep recording new songs. As the Grammy date approached, Dawn looked more and more tired. But we would finally do one last concert, and after that Dawn could rest for a week before the award ceremony, and then we would end the year. We usually ended each concert with Patsy Cline's old hit True Love. Before we started the song, however, I decided to do something I had been thinking about for weeks. Once the crowd had more or less quieted down, I got down on one knee and pulled a small box out of my pocket. Opening it, I revealed a two-carat diamond ring. Then I asked Dawn to be my wife. Her mouth opened and she screamed, Yes! Then I wrapped her in my arms and kissed her tenderly. The crowd went wild. When we separated, the crowd was still cheering. We smiled and waved at each other for a few moments, and then we started playing our last song of the evening, True Love. The song was very special that night. Months after that performance, I was revisiting the video, especially the footage of the people in the audience. I didn't see many dry eyes. Now that meant we had planned to get married two months after the Grammys. But a few months ago, we decided to leave Atlanta in the rearview mirror. Neither of us liked living in or near the big city. We talked about moving back to Tifton, but my parents had recently moved to Florida. We decided to follow them and bought a house in the center of the state. 
It was about a half-hour drive from Orlando. About a week after we settled into our new home, all the litigation came to an end. As I expected, everything was going to be split 50-50. All that was left was for the accountants to finish the audit. My lawyers apologized for not getting more, but I was ecstatic. The fight was over and Tanya disappeared from my life. But when the accountant's report came out, it was a bombshell. Todd had embezzled about $2 million. The accountants finally got their hands on Todd's records to expose the thief. Not only was Todd arrested, but Tanya immediately began divorce proceedings. Although Tanya's career was in no danger, her big dream of rising to the top with Todd crashed and burned. You'd think I'd be ecstatic, but I felt sad and tired from the whole mess. Besides, my own life was on the verge of collapse and I didn't even realize it. Part 6 When the news of Todd's betrayal of Tanya became public, you'd think I'd be ecstatic, but that wasn't the case. I mean, I couldn't have planned a more perfect revenge than to have Todd steal a big chunk of Tanya's money and having the man who stole my wife from me go to jail. Not only that, but my cheating ex-wife's career took a major hit. The next day, another Tanya-related scandal broke. Allegedly, Todd stole songs from young songwriters and forced Tanya to record them. One of these songs had a good success and made it to 14th place. To make matters worse for Tanya, there were doubts as to whether she knew about the thief. I should have been over the moon about Tanya's fall. But really, I was just sad for her and for myself. Grandpa's words were now rattling around in my head. I'm sure the loss of money had hurt Tanya, and the song scandal had tarnished her reputation. But I was sure what really hurt her was the realization that Todd had used her and hadn't helped her career one bit. It should have been a devastating blow to her. But for me, it was just a passing thought. I didn't love Tanya anymore, and while I was sad for her, I wasn't going to lose sleep over it. Now that Don and I were engaged, my main concerns were centered on my future wife and my future daughter, Allison. I was a little sad to wind down our activities, but I would gladly trade any music career for the love of Don and Allison. Unfortunately, I had been pushing everyone for so long that the very moment I found true happiness, disaster struck. When we finished our last concert, it was obvious that Don was completely exhausted. I had to admit that I was exhausted too, so I suggested we skip the Grammys and just rest. But to my surprise, Dawn really wanted to go. When I asked her why, Dawn smiled and said she wanted to see all the celebrities. I couldn't help but laugh. However, the Grammys turned into a nightmare and my whole life started to spiral out of control. And I had planned to return to the studio as soon as we got back from the tour. However, Dawn was so exhausted and suffering from bowel problems that I told her to rest. I also insisted that she go to the doctor for a checkup. Our GP diagnosed diverticulosis and prescribed antibiotics, bed rest, and a change of diet. Dawn did all of these things and it seemed to help her. While Dawn was recovering, I recorded the song, Please Say You'll Love Me Forever. I had hoped to record it with Dawn, but because of her health problems, I recorded it as a single. When Dawn rested and got better, I decided we could record it as a duet. Anyway, when it was ready, Alex released it as a single. I thought that if we won a Grammy, it would give the song a boost. However, that didn't happen. The day we were supposed to attend the Grammys, Dawn complained of a stomach ache, and I again suggested we skip the event. Dawn said she would take an antacid, but we would definitely go. I was incredulous, but agreed to go on the condition that Dawn rest all day until the awards ceremony. She did. So, the night before the big event, we were both dressed to the hilt. I was wearing a tuxedo, and Dawn was wearing a beautiful light blue dress. Before we left, I turned on the TV and tuned it to the channel that would be broadcasting the Grammy Awards. I told my parents that Allison could stay until 9 o'clock at night. I hoped she would at least see us on the red carpet before the event started. As we pulled up to the theater, I noticed that Dawn was pale, but she insisted that we go in. I should have tempered my fervor and asked the driver to take us to the hospital. When I suggested this, Dawn refused, but agreed to drive to the emergency room. When we were about halfway down the carpet, we were asked if we would do a little interview. Dawn readily agreed because she knew that at home Allison would be chained to the TV. But when the reporter asked his first question, Dawn turned pale and started to give up. I quickly grabbed her and lifted her into my arms. Rushing back outside, 
I hoped to find our limo, but it was gone. Luckily, I ran into a police officer and asked him to call an ambulance. Five minutes later, we were on our way to the nearest hospital. Dawn disappeared into the hospital corridor, where I was not allowed in. Instead, I was directed to a waiting room. I had never been so scared and confused in my life. All I could do was pray and cry. About two hours later, my parents and Claire arrived with a wrapped and sleeping Allison. My mom hugged me, and I cried on her shoulder for a long time. When there were no more tears left, I picked Allison up and cuddled her to me. Three hours later, the surgeon came out to see us. He explained that Dawn's intestines had ruptured. About four inches of the lower intestine had to be removed, and Dawn would have to wear a colostomy bag for several months. But right now, their biggest concern was the infection that had already spread to her abdomen. If they couldn't deal with the infection, Dawn would die. Around six in the morning, Allison woke up in my arms and hugged me. Where's mommy? She asked, looking up at me from downstairs. Your mom is very sick, I tried to explain in a voice choked with emotion. The doctors are trying to fix her. Allison put her arms around me. Mom told me that you're going to take care of us now and keep us safe. So as long as you're here, I know mom will get better. I got upset again and must have scared Allison because she started crying too. At this point, mom took her away from me and I just sat there in a daze. Shortly after that, a nurse in medical clothes showed up. The doctor said you can see your wife for a few minutes. I didn't bother to correct the nurse and tell her that we weren't married yet. I was afraid I wouldn't be allowed to see down. She looked so small and fragile lying in the hospital bed. I couldn't believe the number of IVs through which antibiotics had been pumped into her. As I crouched next to Dawn's bed and took her hand, she opened her eyes and smiled weakly at me. How are you feeling? I asked. About as good as you look, I think, she replied in a broken voice. I love you, I said, kissing her hand. I love you too, Dawn replied and went back to sleep. And they told me I could come over again in the afternoon. So I gathered up my parents, Claire and Allison, and we headed home. My mom made us breakfast, but I wasn't very hungry. Allison insisted on eating her breakfast sitting on my lap. When Allison went to bed around 9.30, I fell asleep. I slept for seven hours. When I returned to the hospital alone, Dawn was already awake but looked very pale. For three days, Dawn had a high fever, and she slept most of the time. I was afraid she was going to die. Finally, on the fourth day, the fever broke. After that, she got stronger and stronger every day. Eventually, we were able to take her home. Dawn needed help because just getting out of bed was very difficult. Her abdominal muscles were cut, and you don't realize how much you use them until you can't. The next four weeks were very difficult for Dawn, and she was in a lot of pain. And I learned something about healing after major surgeries. Healing doesn't happen at a steady pace. You can have three good days in a row and then feel like you haven't recovered at all. But gradually, you do get better. There were days, however, when Dawn would fall into a deep depression and start crying. The severity of the illness was compounded by the fact that about seven weeks after the first surgery, Dawn had to have another one to reattach everything and get rid of the colostomy bag. Recovery from the second surgery was even worse than the first. Some days Dawn was so depressed that I doubted if she would ever recover. But finally, after about three months, Dawn seemed strong enough for me to do anything other than doctor's visits. I decided that we would have a picnic by the lake that was on our property. We bought 50 acres of land on which we built a house. A contractor dredged the lake to use fill to raise our house and the surrounding area to the proper elevation. I invited my parents and Claire to join us. It was the first time I saw Dawn truly relaxed and enjoying herself. Even if she was just sitting and watching what everyone else was doing, Dawn was happy. As we sat and watched Allison play with my dad, Dawn turned to me. I never asked about the Grammys. Did you win? I smiled at her and shook my head. Oh, I'm sorry, she said, looking at me to see if I was disappointed. No. Why not? Asked Dawn with confusion on her face. Because if I won, we'd be under pressure to start touring again. I know you wouldn't like that, and right now I don't want to do anything but stay close to you and Allison. Alex has a concert planned for us for the end of the year, but I'm not sure I want to do even that. We've also been asked to be a part of the Christmas special. That's one I definitely think we should do. They asked if Allison could participate. 
I think it would be fun. Dawn looked out at the lake and sighed. Then she turned to me with tears in her eyes. Thank you for singing with me in Central Park. From the emotion that came over me, all I could say was, thank you for letting me sing with you. We were married four weeks after that picnic. It was a small service on our patio with only immediate family and close friends in attendance. I can't explain it, but that wedding made me happier than I had ever been in my life. I was even happier than when I married Tanya. I guess I always felt like Tanya didn't feel the same way I felt about her. I guess deep down, I was always afraid she would leave me. When that happened, it was probably the saddest day of my life. But as they say, when God closes one door, he opens another. Tanya closed one door and Dawn opened a new one for me. I was so consumed with Dawn and Allison that I didn't pay attention to anything outside of my family. At the reception, we were asked if they wanted to share anything with us on their wedding day. Alex stood up and said that my single, Please Tell Me You'll Love Me, went to number one on the country charts. He also said that the song had crossed over to the pop charts and was at number four. Our guests screamed with delight and Dawn showered me with the longest and most passionate kisses I had ever received. Alex wanted us to hit the road again, but I flatly refused. But it was Dawn who made me change my mind. No, she didn't want to tour again, but she definitely wanted me to come back, and she promised to come with me while Allison was off at school. Reluctantly, I agreed, but as I passed one stop after another, I was glad Dawn had insisted. Wherever I performed, whether in a small nightclub or a large arena, I was greeted by enthusiastic, sold-out crowds. Sometimes Dawn would join me on stage to perform a song or two. When she did, the audience roared approvingly. But that was very rare. Still, I loved her for it. At the end of the year, Dawn did come out to a concert with me. All the tickets were sold out months before the show. I'd even heard of people buying tickets for $1,000 or more. I didn't believe it until the police arrested one man trying to sell three tickets for $4,000. In a television special called Country Christmas, Dawn and I performed along with half a dozen other country bands. Since we weren't performing in front of a live audience, Dawn really enjoyed being on the show. The program was a hit, and Allison stole the show. She turned out to be a little ham with a great voice. The program first aired in mid-December, but it was so popular that it was rebroadcast twice more before Christmas. Right after that, the offers came pouring in for Allison. Dawn and I strongly disagreed. We weren't going to let the glitz of show business ruin our daughter's childhood. However, when she turned 16, we let her record her first single. It went platinum in no time. However, Dawn and I were unanimous in not allowing Allison to tour until she turned 18. Nevertheless, we made concessions and allowed her to perform every year. We allowed Allison to join us for the country Christmas show. Allison looked forward to this performance every year, and it became a holiday tradition for us in the audience. Eleven months after Dawn and I were married, Trey Robert joined our family. Fifteen months later, Cassandra joined us. Allison became like a second mom to both of them. And as soon as they learned to talk, Allison started organizing shows that involved all three of them. Dawn rolled her eyes every time Allison announced they had a new show, but I adored them. I recorded ten more songs, some of which were very good and some of which were so-so. But after twelve more years of gigs, I was starting to get tired of traveling and time away from my family. Dawn was sympathetic to my desire to perform. When the kids were out of school, they all joined me if I was on the road. Our 50 acres grew to 75, and the main compound was walled and gated. We also had round-the-clock security to ward off overzealous fans. As I approached my 45th birthday, I only did seven or eight concerts a year. Dawn, on the other hand, was limited almost exclusively to the Christmas show. Occasionally, however, I could still get her to come on stage and sing a few songs with me. When that happened, the audience still went crazy. As my schedule began to wind down, Allison's schedule was growing. She was doing three major tours a year, as well as charity concerts and television appearances. Over the years, I had written most of the songs that Allison had recorded to great acclaim, but now I was recording very few. Alex was still my manager, but he was training his son, John, assuming he would someday take over. Although Alex is now 78 years old, I'm not sure when he will finally retire. My dad died three years ago, and now my mom and Claire share an apartment. 
They're thick as thieves and spend their days going from one store to another. They started doing this years ago. My dad never complained because almost everything they bought went to one charity or another. The only thing he complained about was that they never distributed what they bought as quickly as they acquired it. I want to share one funny incident involving my first wife, Susie. When Tanya left me and it became public, Susie sent me a postcard with a picture of her husband's last dealership. It said, Yeah, I may have gained a few pounds, but you lost about 120 pounds. Your wife. You are such a loser. Susie. When I married Dawn, I sent Susie my card. It was a picture of Dawn and me just after the wedding. Susie, I'm sorry it took me so long to respond. Thank you for your concern during a difficult time for me. I have to admit you were right, but not about that. I was a loser when I married that 120 pounds, not because I lost her. As you can see, I replaced those 120 pounds with 110 pounds of pure love. And Susie, really? A few pounds? I think you need to get a new scale. Robbie, I am truly sorry for the time I spent trying to ruin Tanya's career. Truth be told, she was never mine to make or break. But because of my obsession with revenge, it wasn't Tanya who suffered, it was Dawn. I made everyone chase a dream that wasn't really mine. My grandfather was right. It almost cost me the most important thing in my life, Dawn. Like I said, I had little, if any, impact on Tanya's career. In the end, that's how it turned out. She didn't have the talent to work her way up. True, she had a few hits with my stolen songs. Tanya also had a few minor hits with songs that were written for her and stolen for her. I won't name names, but one of them made it to number seven on the country chart, and the other three were in the top 20. As the years went by, I ran into Tanya from time to time. She was even one of the opening artists at two of my concerts. When I was first told that Tanya would be performing for me, I was going to decline. But Dawn convinced me to let her perform. She said it would be my way of getting her over. I sang with Tanya at both concerts, but refused to perform Patsy Cline's True Love with her. That song I now only sang with Dawn. Tanya and I had a little talk after the second show. Robbie, I know the words sorry don't mean anything right now, but I'm sorry, Tanya said brokenly. You're right, it doesn't mean anything right now, I replied. However, I have long since forgotten what happened between us. When my first wife left me, I thought my life was over. Then I met you, and we got married. And it wouldn't have happened if Susie hadn't divorced me. Same thing happened when you left me. If you hadn't, I never would have met Dawn and never would have had the career I did. So as far as I'm concerned, it's all good. However, I said with a sigh, there's one thing I'm still a little upset about. I believe you destroyed the original copies of my songs that you stole. Tanya nodded. I couldn't risk them being found. And I, I should have been angry with Tanya, but I just couldn't get my act together. Tanya had spent most of her life burning with the desire to be famous. She chased a dream that was never meant to come true and let the rest of her life slip away from her. Unfortunately, she's still chasing it to this day. And I have no doubt that if Tanya had the opportunity to steal a few more songs from me, she would do it in a heartbeat. But these days, Tanya is losing ground. Age is starting to take its toll, as it does on all of us. Of course, I can't criticize her much because I've been chasing the same dream for a few years myself. But I was chasing a star not for myself, but to rub Tanya's nose in my success. And now, I just can't bring myself to exalt her. The futility of my actions became obvious when Dawn got sick. I was so consumed with my revenge that I lost sight of what was most important. Eventually, I gave up trying to pursue a bigger and better career than Tanya. And the funny thing is, once I gave up trying to be a superstar, I became one. I have to admit that I don't like being a celebrity. Being famous is not at all what people think it is. It's hard for me to go somewhere without being recognized. I've started disguising myself when I want to go out in public, especially with Dawn. She thinks it's hilarious and is very amused by each new disguise. Nevertheless, they work pretty well. However, if I linger outside too long, someone is sure to recognize me. I was looking forward to returning home after a long and arduous tour. However, I had one last performance to make at the Stagecoach Festival in California. I was one of the headliners for this show, but I figured it would be an easy gig. I only had two songs to sing and then I would hit the road. Unfortunately. I had to sit and wait, 
as I was the third to last performer that night. After finishing two songs, I started to walk off stage, wondering if my limo had arrived to take me to the airport. However, I had only managed to take three steps before the crowd started chanting more. I quickly walked off stage, but the chanting didn't subside. It was awkward because Chris Collins was scheduled to perform next, but the crowd wouldn't subside. They kept chanting for me to come back. I was embarrassed because it wasn't fair to Chris. He was fairly new to country music, but he had three number one hits in a row. I had worked with him before, and we got along great. Anyway, Chris was standing by the stage waiting for things to settle down, but they didn't. He looked at me and started laughing. Finally, he came over, took my hand, and dragged me back to the stage. And now when the audience saw the two of us, they went into a frenzy. The audience started jumping up and down in the aisles. After a few minutes of pandemonium, things quieted down a bit. How about Robbie and I sing together, yelled Chris into the microphone. That got the crowd excited again. All we could do was start playing and hope things would calm down. It took about 20 seconds, but then the crowd quieted down to listen. We sang one of Chris's hits first, and then one of mine. We sang a few songs and tried to leave the stage, but Sandy Younger came on stage before we could do so. She was known as the golden voice of country music. I always thought she should have been called country music's golden body. She was great. When Sandy approached us, I thought Chris and I would just slip outside. But Sandy had another idea. She grabbed both of us. You two are having too much fun, she accused us. I want in on it too. That sent the crowd into an even bigger frenzy. And for the next hour and a half, the three of us continued to entertain the crowd. We alternated between playing our own songs and singing together. Sometimes it was just two of us, sometimes all three of us. By the end, I was exhausted and drenched in sweat. Chris was in a little better shape than me, but he was covered in sweat too. I don't know how she managed it, but Sandy looked as fresh as she did the first time she first came on stage. After the show, all the performers and support people gathered at the hotel where we talked and drank for two hours. It was past midnight when I finally made it to the plane I had hired. On the way home, I tried to sleep. I, I arrived home around 7 in the morning, the day before my 45th birthday. I was groggy and spent the next 10 hours trying to catch up on my sleep. When I woke up and finally got dressed, everyone was out on the back patio. Dawn was preparing a barbecue dinner, and I got there just in time. Glad you could make it, honey, she said, kissing me passionately. Oh, disgusting, Daddy, Trey stuck out his tongue. Get a room. We have a room, Dawn said with a smirk. It's at the beginning of the stairs on the right. We'll be using it tonight. Oh my God, Mom, Trey shouted. TMI, TMI, TMI. What do you mean too much information? Asked Cassandra, standing up next to her brother. Nothing for the ears of the baby in the family, Trey smirked, looking at his sister. Stop calling me a baby, Cassandra slapped her brother on the arm. You're only a year older than me. Fifteen months, Trey corrected. Okay, you two, just calm down, Dawn chided them. I laughed and grabbed a plate, filling it with spare ribs, coleslaw, beans, and cornbread. I also grabbed a beer and settled in at the far end of the patio. Our house stood on a hill overlooking 75 acres of land. Since we had purchased it, we had expanded the grounds. Not only did we now have a pool and tennis courts, but we also had a basketball court. There were ATV trails and a three-horse barn. We expanded our man-made lake to accommodate a motorboat and sailboat tied to the dock. And the only thing Dawn didn't make a fuss about was the pool. She fought over the horses, but Allison desperately wanted them. Ever since she was a little girl, Allison had loved horses. I finally convinced Dawn to let me buy one horse and hire a riding instructor. I told my wife that eventually Allison would get tired of caring for the horse, and then we would get rid of it. Apparently, Allison never got tired of horses, so now we have three. To Allison's credit, she paid for the other two horses out of the royalties for her first hit song. Dawn said that the basketball court and tennis court would probably not be used after the first few weeks. At this point, Dawn finally admitted she was wrong. Trey and I often went out archery and it wasn't unusual for me to find Trey and his friends playing pickup ball when I got home. Sometimes I would join them if the sides were unequal. I wasn't kidding myself. I couldn't keep up with those guys. But I could hit the ball. The tennis courts were a different matter. Cassandra got into the game after a year of tennis instruction. 
she became good enough to make the school team. But it was Dawn who used the tennis courts the most. She loved playing with Cassandra and her friends. She even got me used to it. And twice a year, we had a charity tennis championship. We'd bring in bleachers and Dawn would raise forty dollars or $50,000 for the event. It seemed like everybody wanted to participate except me. Of course, at the very beginning, Dawn informed me that it was impossible to refuse to participate. I am convinced that I was put on the program to be a comedian. All my kids learned to water ski at the lake, and Trey loved to swim. I can water ski too, but it's not something I'm really interested in. If the kids and Dawn want to do it, I'll go along with it. I love the ATV trails we have all over the property. We also have access to the State Park ATV trails behind our property. Every 4th of July, I used to bring my old singing partners George and Simon and their families. I also brought George and Mabel with Tyrone and his family. They would stay with me for a week and it was all fun and exciting. And every night ended with cooking and singing. It was wonderful to have a loving family and such good friends. The years went by and I realized I was getting older because each tour was getting harder and harder. On the night of my 45th birthday, Dawn rented my favorite restaurant in Orlando. It was a private party with about 150 friends and family in attendance. Sometime during the evening, Allison handed me a guitar and told me it was time to sing for our dinner. We sang for about 20 minutes, when I was surprised by what happened next. Trey and Cassandra had been taking music lessons for a few years now, but I had been so busy I hadn't noticed how far they had come. I'd heard them sing when Allison put on music shows at her house. They both had nice voices, but they were timid and unsure when Allison put them to work. When Allison called a break, she told me to sit next to my wife in the front row. Dawn just pressed herself against me. I quickly realized that she knew what was going on. As for me, I would have to wait and see. The wait wasn't long when Trey and Cassandra joined their sister with their guitars. I expected Allison to take matters into her own hands at this point. So I was completely surprised when Trey took the mic, told some funny stories about his sisters, and then started a guitar solo. Stunned is the only word to describe my reaction. But as surprised as I was, I was shocked when Cassandra joined him and the two of them took the hall by storm. But that wasn't the biggest surprise that night. As the applause died down, Allison handed the microphone back and said that the three of them had written a special song for me. Cassandra started, Trey soon joined her, and Allison finally weaved her voice in. It was the sweetest music I had ever heard. As the words began to flow on their own, tears streamed down my face. I later learned that the song was called With My Father's Love. My three children recorded this song, which went to number one on the country and pop music charts. That night I lay spooning with Dawn after making love for quite some time. I told her that I really enjoyed the birthday party, but I didn't think they could ever top that one. And so it was until my 50th birthday came around. In the weeks leading up to my 50th birthday, I took great pleasure in watching my children and wife bustle around, working on some plans of their own. From time to time, I would catch them holding their heads together. When I would ask what they were doing, they would just giggle. I probably would have paid more attention, but I had other concerns. I was doing things I didn't want my family to know about because they would be furious if they found out. On my 50th birthday, I discovered that they had planned a surprise brunch with 50 guests. Anyone who didn't know my family well would have assumed that this was their big birthday surprise. However, after an afternoon nap, I was informed that I had to be ready for dinner by 6 o'clock. My spidey senses quivered. I figured they were planning another awesome birthday dinner, but I was wrong. The limo was a new touch. One of those stretch models that allowed the whole family to be seated comfortably and uncluttered. The tinted windows made it hard to look out of and impossible to look inside. I thought it was a clever idea. Allison was such a big star that a quiet evening could quickly turn into a zoo if she was recognized. It would also probably turn into a zoo if they recognized me. We made great time as the limo whizzed back and forth through the many side streets until we pulled through a gate into a small parking lot. I didn't think about anything until the car came to a stop. Why did we stop? I asked with a slight concern in my voice as Allison started to get out of the limo. She told me to follow her if I wanted to get my present. I wasn't surprised that my daughter had hidden my gift so that I wouldn't find it. It was well known in our family that I was a fan of going through presents, especially at Christmas. So I got out of the car and followed my daughter. 
Allison raced ahead and we struggled to keep up. It wasn't until we reached the stage that I realized we had entered the Mercury Center, the newest music venue in our area, from the back door. It struck me that Allison had decided to hide my gift right here because there was no chance I would ever find it. The rest of the family was laughing and joking around trying to keep up with my daughter. I finally spotted her in the center of the stage where the only overhead light illuminated her. Come out here, Daddy, she called out to me. Your present is right here. Grinning, I walked out to where Allison was standing. Suddenly, the lights came on in the auditorium and a roar erupted from the seats. Twenty-odd thousand people rose to their feet, applauding. Then Allison's cheerleaders jumped on stage and began to play. Soon the entire audience was singing, Happy Birthday. To me, as a large cake with fifty burning candles was rolled onto the stage. With the crowd still roaring at the end of my birthday song, Allison gave me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. Cassandra and Trey were by my side a few seconds later, hugging me tightly. My parents hugged me too, as did Aunt Claire. Dawn then found herself in my arms and smothered me with a deep, passionate kiss. All of this caused more roars from the audience. As things began to quiet down, the doors opened and the sergeants brought in dozens of large, pre-cut birthday cakes and began handing them out. That drew even more applause. When I was a little girl, Allison said through the seething crowd, this wonderful man decided to sing with my mom in Central Park. This brought the crowd to its feet again and sparked another roar. Echoing the noise, Allison shouted out, I think you've heard the story. I'd like to start tonight with the very first song my mom and dad sang together. And then my family, including me, sang Amazing Grace. After that, we went from one song to the next. Sometimes Allison sang her hits, sometimes I did. Cassandra and Trey added their hits, as well as songs made famous by other performers. Trey and I performed Banjo Duel from the movie Deliverance. Even Dawn sang three songs by herself. I can never forget what a beautiful voice she has. The birthday concert went on for three and a half hours. Dawn and I ended the concert with the song Tour Love. When we finally left the stage, the crowd was still screaming, demanding a continuation. As we walked back to the limo, I felt so guilty seeing Dawn's face brighten. I prayed she would never find out about my secret life because it would crush her. A little over three months after my birthday concert, I was finally able to end the secret life I had been leading. In fact, our relationship ended consensually. I decided then that I was going to be the best and most attentive husband in the world. I swore to myself that there would be no more secrets between Dawn and me. That promise, however, I did not keep. Even though I knew it would devastate Dawn, I couldn't stop. For almost four years, I had managed to keep my secrets. And there have been some really good times over the years. I cut down my gigs to one or two a year. But every time a date for one of my concerts was announced, all the tickets were sold out within 15 minutes. Despite the reduction in gigs, I continued to write and record songs. I now had 28 platinum records, and 21 of them hit the pop charts. I also wrote songs for all three of my children. Four of them became number one hits for Allison. Trey and Cassandra each had two top five hits from songs I wrote. All three of my children got married. Allison married Alex's grandson, Daniel. Since Alex was my manager all those years ago, Allison and Danny practically grew up together. Danny was a great studio guitarist and had a pretty good voice. He was a backup singer for some of the biggest names in music, including my band. But Daniel wasn't interested in the entertainment side. He loved the business. His grandfather taught him everything about being an entertainment manager. Danny wanted to follow his grandfather and father into the business. As I learned over the years, many very talented and successful entertainers didn't really like performing. Fortunately for me, I learned a long time ago that I find it easy to connect with audiences. As I've said many, many times, it's all about the music. I'm just a guitarist who sings a little bit. Music fills my soul. And if others enjoy it, so much the better. Trey was one of those people who didn't really enjoy performing. However, that was not the reason why he gave up the activity. The reason he gave up performing was because of the name Jenny Tallow. Jenny was a professor at a local university, and Trey and his band were giving a concert there. At the time, Jenny was an advisor to the Entertainment Committee of the university's Student Senate. 
Apparently, there were numerous problems with the sound system, which Jenny frantically tried to resolve. However, after hours of negotiations with the union electricians, the sound system still wouldn't work. Trey watched Jenny's efforts with humor and sympathy. He had dealt with unions before and was sure they would do little to solve the problems. Finally, Trey pulled out his cell phone and made a call. Forty-five minutes later, a portable sound system was delivered and set up in the college auditorium. According to Trey, the union electricians were very angry that non-union employees had installed an alternative sound system. They threatened to file a grievance, but Jenny pulled both barrels. She told the electricians that they could do whatever they wanted. However, they would have to do it after they left the hall or she would have them arrested. All six workers left with their tails tucked. According to Trey, he fell in love with Jenny that night, but it took him two months to get her to go on a date with him. A year after their first date, Trey and Jenny got married. About three months after the wedding, Trey quit performing. He didn't want to jeopardize his marriage by leaving home so often. Instead, he took a teaching job at the same university where Jenny taught. Trey was hired to teach entertainment business. He was only supposed to teach two classes a week. But his course is so popular that the university convinced him to teach two extra classes, and they are always full. Cassandra turned out to be our problem child. I think she has always existed in the shadow of her two older siblings. Unlike Trey, Cassandra loved to perform and had a great career. She may never reach the heights that Allison achieved, but Cassandra was definitely an A-list artist. As her career began to take off, Cassandra got a little wild. She got involved in partying, started drinking a lot and doing drugs. Thankfully, Cassandra didn't become a drug addict. And after a confrontation with Dawn, Sunday come to Jesus, she moderated her alcoholism considerably and stopped doing drugs altogether. Then things seemed to get better, but then they got bad again. Cassandra hit the road again, and her music career continued to grow. But then she met and hired Lance Talbot. I hated him from the first time I met him. Lance was the epitome of everything wrong with the music industry. He was a handsome lead guitarist with tons of charm, but no morals and a shitty voice. Cassandra fell deeply in love with him and married him in Vegas without saying anything to anyone. The marriage started falling apart almost from the beginning. Lance cheated on my little girl almost from the beginning. I guess he thought that by marrying Cassandra, he could take our family name to the top. And at first I did try to help him out, providing studio time, a voice coach, and even a few songs I wrote myself. But aside from being good-looking and a great guitarist, Lance was an empty shell. Eventually, he ran off with the lead singer of an up-and-coming band. Cassandra was crushed. But even though Lance ran away, he left something behind for Cassandra. She was pregnant. And a few months after that, it was discovered that all of my children were expecting a baby. The first to give birth was Cassandra's baby girl, whom she named Lacey. Two months later, Jenny and Trey had a boy they named Jason. A month after that, Allison and Danny had another baby girl they named Angelina. As much as I promised to put my secret life behind me, I couldn't. About 16 months after Cassandra gave birth to Lacey, I started again. This time, however, I knew Dawn would find out anyway. So I decided to come clean. Still, I wanted to spend one last night with my grandchildren. I was sure that after I confessed everything to my wife, my time with them would be severely limited if they would let me see them at all. It the whole family gathered at our house to celebrate Memorial Day. We set up cribs in one of the guest rooms so all three little ones could sleep together. I took my guitar and recorder into their room. I told everyone that I was going to sing my three grandchildren to sleep. My family looked at me with loving smiles as I went upstairs. I couldn't help but think about how much they would hate me when I told everyone about what I was doing. But that would be tomorrow. Tonight was just for me and my grandchildren. As I started up the tape recorder, I looked at my three grandchildren who stood in their cribs, smiling and giggling as I strummed the guitar. I sang a few children's songs until they lay down and watched me through the cribs. Then, one by one, they fell asleep. While they were just falling asleep, I decided that I would sing songs that their parents had made popular and songs that Don and I were good at. I also decided to intersperse it all with funny stories about their parents, Don and me. Don. Tears ran down my cheeks as I read the last part of Robbie's journal. I remembered waking up the next morning to find Robbie hadn't come to bed. 
I found him still in his chair next to his grandchildren. But when I went to wake him up, I found Robbie was gone. The coroner said he had suffered a massive heart attack during the night. Robbie turned out to be partly right when he learned of our reaction to what he had been doing in secret. We were terribly saddened and disappointed when we found out what Robbie was doing, but only because it was a secret he wanted to share with us. The secret that Robbie was so afraid I would find out about was that he had cancer. He had successfully fought it when it was first discovered. However, the cancer had returned. At the same time, it was determined that Robbie needed open heart surgery. Doctors decided that they needed to treat his heart first before proceeding with the cancer treatment. But Robbie's heart failed before anything could be done. Tears streamed down my cheeks. God, I wish he had told me this so I could have been there for him during this must have been a scary time. But it was Robbie. From the first time we'd sung together in Central Park, he'd always tried to protect me. The family was devastated, but we were stunned at how all of Robbie's fans were grieving. Thousands and thousands of floral arrangements started showing up at our gate. Thousands of people came for weeks to leave memorabilia, flowers, or sing a few Robbie songs. I know it wasn't on the same scale as after Elvis Presley's death, but close to it. Many radio stations around the country devoted an entire day to playing only our family's songs. But I hardly noticed anything because I was so inconsolable. It was months before I could function at all. The recording of Robbie singing to his grandchildren was made by Alex, and he released it as an album. It went to number one on both the country and pop charts. It stayed at number one on the country chart for six weeks and number one on the pop chart for eight weeks. I'm better now, but sometimes I think of Robbie and start crying again. But those moments happen less and less often. Right now, I'm focused on the fact that Allison and Jenny are pregnant again. I can't wait for the babies to be born, but some part of me is sad that Robbie will never get to meet them and they won't have the chance to know their grandfather. Damn, just thinking about it makes me cry again. Oh God, Robbie, I miss you so much. Thanksgiving is just around the corner and then the Christmas season will be upon us. The network is already gearing up for our annual Christmas show. The TV people think this year's show will have the biggest audience ever. And as much as I hate performing, I can't wait for this show. It will still be unaccustomed without Robbie, but I know he'll be watching, and I know he'll be smiling. Next, Robbie has said he's just a guitar player who loves to sing, but he's so much more than that. I love him very much and will miss him terribly. The end. If you haven't watched the first part of this video, the link will be in the description. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.